Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see this time around, we're going to go over how to calculate goodwill in M&A deals and merger models, why it exists, and show you a few simple examples of how this works. Now, this one does not actually come directly from a reader or watcher question, but it comes from the fact that I was looking at this channel the other day and I realized that we had videos on topics like negative goodwill and bargain purchases, and also topics like purchase price allocation for non-controlling interests, but we don't have anything specifically on a far more basic topic, which is how to calculate goodwill in the first place. Also, even though it's a fairly basic topic, we actually get a surprising number of questions about it, despite the fact that there's detailed coverage in our guides and courses. There are lots of articles online on Investopedia, Wikipedia, other sources like that. It still seems to cause a fair amount of confusion. So. Here goes our explanation, starting with why goodwill exists and a simple example. Once we go through that, then we'll look at a slightly more complex example and some added complexities that can come up in this calculation in real life with more advanced models. So why does goodwill exist? The short answer is that goodwill is an accounting construct that exists because in M&A deals, buyers almost always pay more than what the seller's balance sheets are worth. So if you look at roughly assets minus liabilities and say that's the value of a seller's balance sheet, to acquire the seller's equity, a buyer is almost always gonna pay more than that number. Now, the buyer gets all the seller's assets and liabilities. So when this happens, when it pays more than what the seller's balance sheet is worth, that makes its balance sheet go out of balance when a deal closes. We create goodwill to fix this imbalance and ensure that assets equals liability plus equity on the combined balance sheet. The basic calculation for goodwill is that it equals the equity purchase price in the deal minus the seller's common shareholder's equity, that's what goes away in the deal, plus the seller's existing goodwill, that also goes away, and then you add or subtract other adjustments to the seller's balance sheet. Let's go through a very simple example in Excel so you can see what this looks like visually. We're going to say here that a buyer pays $1,000 in cash for the seller, and the seller has $1,500 in assets, $600 in liabilities, and common shareholders' equity of $900. So let's go into Excel and see what this looks like. Here is our target company right here. We have cash of $200, accounts receivable of $300, PP&E of $1,000, and so total assets equals $1,500. And then on the liability side, they have debt of $400, accounts payable of $200, equity of 900, and so liabilities plus equity equals 1,500, and our balance sheet for the seller balances. Now, the buyer is going to pay $1,000 for the equity purchase price for the seller right here. And if we look at the acquirer's balance sheet, which is similar to the targets, just a whole lot bigger because the buyer is a bigger entity, and we simply combine the acquirer and targets balance sheets as is, so we just go in and literally add up each item, cash, accounts receivable, PP&E, accounts payable, debt, and so on. If we just do this, the balance sheets actually balance. But of course, that's not what happens in an M&A deal. In an M&A deal, we have to reflect the fact that the seller's common shareholder's equity is written down and the fact that we spend cash or debt or stock to acquire the seller. So here, we'll keep it simple and just say that we are spending $1,000 in cash to acquire the seller and I'll link to that 1,000 up there. Now in our combined column over here, we take the acquirer's numbers plus the target's numbers plus these transaction adjustments. And so we end up with 700 of cash right here. Now what also happens is that on the other side, we need to wipe out the seller's shareholder's equity. So we can just link to that and reverse it directly. And so you can see the problem right here. Our balance sheet goes out of balance because our asset side here goes up by 500, but then our liabilities and equity side goes up by 600. Now, if we had paid exactly 900 for the target instead, so exactly matching its common shareholders equity, then we would not have gotten this problem because in that scenario, the asset side would go up to 7,600 and the liabilities and equity side would go up to 7,600. And so to fix this issue, I'll change it back to 1,000 for now. To fix this issue, we create something called goodwill. And it follows that exact same formula that I showed you before. We take our equity purchase price, the 1,000 right there, and then we subtract the seller's common shareholder's equity because that gets written down in the deal. 
that reduces the liabilities and equity side. And so it's going to reduce the amount of goodwill we need. The liabilities and equity side goes down, so the asset side does not need to be as high to balance it. And then we're also going to add in the seller's existing goodwill because this is written down and reallocated in the deal. So in this case, we simply get 1,000 minus that 900, and we don't have anything else for these other items, so we can just say for now that the goodwill created is equal to the 100 right here. And then when we go and fill that in on the balance sheet, we go under transaction adjustments here. And let's write down the seller's goodwill. So we'll put a negative sign in front of that. And then we'll add the new goodwill that gets created. Now we can see that our balance sheet balances. Our total assets is 7,600 and our total liabilities and equity is 7,600 and our balance check says okay. So that is the short five minute version of why we need goodwill and how it works. So as I say here, we get this imbalance because liabilities are up by 600, assets are up by 500 if we don't have goodwill. We create goodwill and also another asset called other intangible assets to balance it, to fix this problem typically. Other intangible assets are for specific identifiable items that have value like trademarks, patents, and customer relationships. Goodwill is for everything else. It's really the plug that makes the balance sheet balance. So the simple calculation, like I just showed you, equity purchase price minus seller's common shareholder's equity plus seller's existing goodwill. The seller's existing goodwill is also written down in the deal because its fair market value is zero. So the new goodwill that you create includes effectively the entire old amount of goodwill plus whatever incremental new portion you have. Now this calculation ignores that other component, other intangible assets, but we'll show you their impact in the next example here. So on that note, let's go into more detail on this calculation and look at some other things that could come up in the goodwill allocation process. So in all M&A deals under both IFRS and US GAAP, buyers must revalue everything on seller's balance sheets. So if the seller has factories or land or inventory and the fair market value of those is different from what's on the balance sheet, which is highly likely, especially for items like real estate and land, then the values must be adjusted when the deal closes and the balance sheets are combined. Many items that represent timing differences, like deferred rent, deferred tax liabilities, deferred tax assets also go away because these types of temporary differences are reversed and then reconciled in M&A deals. So any remaining owed taxes or owed rent or other items like that are paid out when the deal closes, everything is reconciled and these items go away for the most part. And you will also often get a new deferred tax liability and sometimes some other new items in the deal. We covered this in a separate video on why deferred tax liabilities get created in M&A deals. So please refer to that if you want some more details on why this happens and some Excel demonstrations of the mechanics here. So in reality, a real goodwill calculation might look a little bit more like the following. Goodwill equals equity purchase price minus seller's common shareholders equity plus seller's existing goodwill minus asset write-ups plus asset write-downs minus liability write-downs plus liability write-ups. The rule here is that if an item increases assets or reduces liabilities and equity, that means that less goodwill is needed to boost assets to balance the balance sheet. Therefore, we can subtract any item that increases assets or reduces the liabilities and equity side. This is why we subtract items like the pp and &E and inventory write-ups. It's also why we subtract liability write-downs such as the deferred tax liabilities that go away in the deal. So to show you an example of this now, let's go back to the same example and extend it. And let's say that we now have a pp and &E write-up of 5%. So this company's plants, property, and equipment, buildings, real estate, and so on are actually worth 5% more on the market than they are on its balance sheet. So let's take this 5% and then go up to the pp and &E balance right here. We have that. And then for the intangible asset write-up, we will say here that we are going to be allocating this out of the 100 allocable purchase premium, which is a standard approach here. And let's just say that 20% of this goes to the company's intangible assets. So items like customer relationships, trademarks, patents, other things like that, that may not show up directly on the balance sheet initially, but which have value to the acquirer. And then we'll take our purchase price to allocate and multiply by the 20%. And then the deferred tax liability here is going to be based on the write-up of both these items, the pp &E write-up and the other intangible write-up or creation times the buyer's tax rate. Again, we get into this in a separate video. Suffice to say that the depreciation and amortization on these write-ups will not be deductible for cash tax purposes. Therefore, we're going to get a deferred tax liability that represents that 
difference between book and cash taxes in future years. And when that difference goes away, the deferred tax liability will also go away. So for the write-up of pp &E, let's link to it up here and use a negative sign. And then for the write-up of intangibles, let's link to it right here and use a negative sign. And then for the new deferred tax liability, this will have a positive sign because we're adding this, we're increasing the liabilities and equity side, so therefore we must create more goodwill for this to bring the asset side up more. By contrast, with the write-up of pp &E, we're increasing the asset side, so it means we need less goodwill. And with the intangibles, we are also increasing the asset side, so it means we need less in goodwill. So let's go in and fill out everything here and see what happens now. Accounts receivable, we're not going to have any adjustments here, so I'll just enter zero. For the plant, property, and equipment adjustment, we'll link down to where we have it in our schedule right here. Other intangible assets, same idea. And then moving down, no adjustments for accounts payable, no adjustments for the debt, because this is an all cash deal. And then for the deferred tax liability, we'll link down and get it right here. And so now we have a couple additional adjustments and our balance sheet still balances. The main difference here really is that we just get less in goodwill because now we've written up more of the other assets. So we're not just plugging the entire gap with goodwill, we're only plugging part of the gap with goodwill. So this example just represents something more similar to what you might actually see in real life in this type of scenario. Let's go into some more detail now. A common follow-up question we get on this topic is, okay, but how do you determine the exact amount of pp and &E and intangibles to write up? What about the new deferred tax liability? How do you figure out all these numbers? The short answer is that you don't have enough information to do it the real way if you only have access to the seller's public filings, because to do it the real way, you need market data for the real estate and the land, for the intangibles, you need some way to project the revenues and cash flows that come from them, and then some type of discount rate, and you have to value them using a mini DCF. You don't have the required data to do this. But you can make some approximations based on recent deals for similar acquired companies in this market. For example, if we want to create goodwill for the potential acquisition of a high growth software company, we might look at something like Atlassian's $384 million acquisition of Trello and use some of the percentages right there. So I've brought up here Atlassian's filing, which lists the purchase price allocation for this Trello acquisition. Goodwill was about 289 million of the 384 million equity purchase price, and intangible assets was about 127 million of that $384 million purchase price. So if you want to do the quick math here, other intangibles are about 33% of the equity purchase price. Goodwill is about 75%. They had no write-up or a minimal write-up for pp and &E and the other items and pretty much just brought them in as is. Now, the newly created deferred tax liability here, 46 or 47 million, is roughly 37% of the intangible assets here that get written up or created in this deal. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything for us because 37% is probably not the tax rate exactly for our buyer, but that is useful as a reference just to show where this number might be coming from. So in our deal, if we believe that this company is similar to Trello, we might create other intangibles such that they represent 33% of the equity purchase price, record the other items as is, and then create a new DTL based on the buyer's tax rate. Now, of course, in our scenario here, this is clearly not a technology company because the pp &E balance is very high. They have no other intangibles right now. It just doesn't seem to be a high growth software company, so we probably wouldn't do it. But if we did have a software company, we might tweak some of these numbers and try to make this percent allocated to other intangible assets much higher. We'd also check at the end to make sure that Goodwill is actually a significant portion of the equity purchase price. So maybe something in the 60 to 80% range rather than only five to 10%, for example. And finally, in the last topic here, I wanna cover a few more added complexities that come up in real life. First off, you can have a lot of different items here beyond just the ones we mentioned. You can have deferred rent, deferred revenue, intercompany accounts receivable and accounts payable that have to be eliminated in a deal. So here, for example, in another one of these schedules, we have the write down of deferred rent. This is for a retail company where deferred rent is very common. We have a write down of their existing deferred tax liabilities. In different deal types, the deferred tax line items work differently in the schedule. 
you might write down the entire deferred tax asset in some cases, but only part of it in other cases, depending on whether it's a stock asset or 338H10 deal. So in another example model I have right here, we actually do a check and we calculate the deferred tax liability slightly differently depending on the deal type because some of the amortization and depreciation from these write-ups may be deductible or not deductible depending on what type of deal it is. We can have more types of intangibles. You can have definite versus indefinite lived ones. And then there are industry specific items like in place lease value and above and below market leases in the real estate or real estate investment trust industry, for example. And we can see it right here in this purchase price allocation and goodwill calculation for a REIT M&A deal. We eliminate deferred rent. We create new assets and liabilities for above and below market leases and also something called acquired in place lease value. And don't forget about earnouts and other contingency payments. Even though those are not paid out directly, they are still put on the balance sheet, and so they'll have to factor into this goodwill calculation. We're at the end, so let's do a recap and summary now. Goodwill exists to plug the gap when a buyer pays more than the seller's common shareholder's equity in an M&A deal, and it has to combine the balance sheets and get everything to balance. Goodwill equals the equity purchase price minus the seller's common shareholder's equity plus the seller's existing goodwill, which is written down, plus or minus all the other adjustments to the seller's balance sheets. Depending on which side you're on, these could be pluses or minuses, and depending on whether you're dealing with write-ups or write-downs, they could be pluses or minuses. The main added complexities here are that you will almost always see some type of write-ups for intangibles, pp and you know, other fixed assets. You'll also see write-downs and write-ups of many of the deferred tax line items, which are quite common among all companies. And then, to make things even more complex, you will see deferred rent and deferred revenue and different treatment of that, intercompany receivables and payables. You will see different treatment of the deferred tax liability depending on the deal type, different types of intangibles, and then also different industry specific items and earnouts and contingent payments as well. And we get into all those in our full courses and guides on our Breaking Into Wall Street site. That's it for this tutorial. You should now have a better idea of how to calculate goodwill why it exists, the simple way to do it, and then some of the added nuances that can come up in real life.